okay uh, welcome to robotics 2 in today's class we will continue the discussion these are yes yes initial x velocity you can change it to zero uh, use zero erosende parameters uh, this is a very good question yeah. if you if you get if you get your simulation working you will see that your air class will start flying and the reason it will start flying because the erosonde parameter file has a non zero x velocity if you change that velocity to zero you will your aircraft will be in static equilibrium so and i just want everyone simulations to work because what we are going to do is at the end of this lesson we are going to append that simulation model uh if you what i want you to verify is if you give a non zero value of fx if you give a positive value of fx which means you are giving a thrust so you should see aircraft going forward if you give it maybe uh, fy then you should see the aircraft going sideways if you provide fz you will see aircraft going up if you will add p q and r you should see appropriate motion of the aircraft pitching rolling and yawing and the reason that is important is in the next uh, part of the project what we are going to do is we are going to add a force and moment block wherein instead of giving the fx fy fz l m n manually we will have a, a model that will compute the aerodynamic forces that will compute the thrust forces and then it will supply those forces and moments to your simulation everyone understood this so just try to uh, get it working so we we in the last class we talked about also the air speed variable is not computed Oh yeah, I will. We will add the airspeed variable, and we will also use the wind model and all that stuff. So it it's coming, it's coming. Okay. So, so I promise you, at the end of this exercise, you will have a full fl uh, blown version of uh, a flight simulator. As a matter of fact, there is one student uh, who actually rendered Boeing three seven three seven, which was the aircraft. Oh, C seventy. So he basically replaced that uh, dummy-looking aircraft with an actual, uh, uh, real-looking aircraft. So it looks very, really nice. And if you want, you can you can ask him for his uh, aircraft file, and then or use his air draw aircraft function. So rather than that uh, dummy-looking glider aircraft, you will actually have a nice-looking aircraft. So it's not difficult. Anyway, so. we talked about the gravitational force we talked about the distribution of air foil on to the uh, pressure on the air foil we looked at the lift and the drag force we looked at the control surfaces of the conventional aircraft we looked at the control surfaces of the v tail aircraft we also looked at the control surfaces of the flying wing aircraft now uh, when i taught similar class long time ago we actually build an rc aircraft and then try to fly it but uh, with new fa regulations it's uh, you cannot fly any aircraft uh, on poly campus because we are so close to the airport So the only place we can fly is indoors, and uh, that's why we are going to use the drone studio, and that is where we are going to fly uh, the aircraft. But fixed wing aircraft, please understand, they cannot hover; they need a non-zero uh, forward speed so that they can generate the lift. But quadcopters, you can fly the quadcopter which I gave you. is very safe you can fly that indoors it's a palm size quadcopter and also it has the it can detect collision so for example if it hits 
it will actually stop. And uh, so that's why this, this quadcopter we have is uh, quite safe to fly indoors. So that is what we are going to uh, experiment on. But we will, we will do the simulation studies on the fixed wing aircraft. Now, we also started talking about the aircraft dynamics. Please try to understand the aircraft dynamical equations of motion are nonlinear. So what we are going to do is we are going to split this aircraft dynamics into longitudinal dynamics and lateral dynamics. And we are going to add controllers in the longitudinal direction and in the lateral direction. And we will also take care of the coupling. So first and foremost, I want you to understand the fundamental relationship between the lift, drag and movement is you have the dynamic pressure, which is one half rho V A square, which is the dynamic pressure quantity. You multiply that pressure quantity by area. S is the wing area. Uh, so you multiply that by S. So now you have force and you multiply that force by something called as coefficient of lift, which is dependent on angle of attack, pitching moment, and elevator deflection. Elevator means uh, the, the flaps in the back that change the, the pitching moment. So basically, uh, same thing happens with the drag. So CD is function of alpha, Q, and delta E. And the moment is also a function of alpha, Q, and delta E. It is very important to note that we, we get these values from a design data book. Uh, as a roboticist, we do not design aircrafts. There are aerodynamic folks and there are aircraft engineers and aerospace engineers who design the aircraft. Our job is to get that aircraft, that robot, and make it fly and make it do the things that we want to do. So we get all this information and then we program it. So it is important to note that for small scale UAVs, linear approximation is often sufficient. What that means is you have this super complicated relationship for coefficient of lift that depends upon three variables. But what I want to do is, I want to use the Taylor series expansion, perform linearization in three dimensions and uh, find out partial CL by partial alpha, partial CL by partial Q, partial CL by partial delta E. So that is the Taylor series expansion for the, the coefficient of lift. It is important to note that coefficient of lift is a dimensionless quantity. So there is no dimension. So to be consistent, the moment which has a Newton meter that needs to be divided by the velocity, which is meter per second, so that the whole expression is in the dimensionless, so that the dimensions match. Then we talked about the linear aerodynamic model. And please understand, for our simulations, we are going to use linear aerodynamic model. But when we look at a very high speed maneuver or aerodynamics, which is high speed or aerodynamics that is uh, in the turbulent environment, at that time, we will look at the nonlinear uh, 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 equations. And again, this linear aerodynamic model is sufficient for small values of angle of attack, so which means you cannot use the linear aerodynamic model uh, if you are performing a very tight maneuvers, like uh, going up, going down, turning left, uh, something like that, or designing a fighter plane or a, a very exotic complicated plane or a tilt rotor. Uh, please understand stall, is something that we want to avoid. Stall means aircraft does not generate lift. Stall can happen when the flow separates from the airfoil and you get eddies that are formed behind the airfoil. If you look at 
the lift model, if you look at the lift model, if you work in the linear region, you have the coefficient of lift, which is a linear function of alpha. So to the point 15 to 16 degrees, the coefficient of lift and alpha, they have a straight line relationship. And at certain critical or threshold value of alpha, the lift drops down. So all of a sudden, what you have is you have increase in the drag. Nonlinear aerodynamic model is uh, basically what you do is you take into account the nonlinear aeroelasticity effect. And then one way to, to kind of approximate this complicated nonlinear function is using a linear model, a blending function, and a flat plate model. What is this flat plate model? Please understand airfoil uh, is a very complex shape. To understand the pressure distribution, to understand the moment distribution, to understand the total forces, we have to perform wind tunnel experiments, which means we have to actually mount that uh, airfoil inside the wind tunnel, control the flow, and whether the flow is laminar or turbulent and Reynolds number that we have to control. And then we have to identify the role, I mean, the pitching moment, uh, coefficient of lift and coefficient of drag. So it's very expensive and time consuming. So sometimes we use CAD, computational fluid dynamics for this analysis. But as a first level approximation, what we have is we treat airfoil as a flat plate because it's you can find out the lift and drag on the flat plate uh, so, sort of in a closed form. So we use a blending function and this blending function is you can think about it like it is mixing or it is like a weighing factor onto this flat plate model. And you will notice that this uh, blending function is a very complicated function and actually you can use uh, this like a, a shape, which is sort of a sigmoid shape that uh, blends the flat plate model with the aerodynamic model. Now, what I want to talk about here is, uh, you will you'll see this uh, quite a lot. CL alpha is called as the stability derivative. Now, what is the physical interpretation of the stability derivative? <laughs> stability, stability derivative is nothing but the sensitivity of lift to the angle of attack. So what means if you change angle of attack, do you get sudden rise in the lift or the rise in the lift is gradual or even if you increase, there are some airfoils wherein you increase the angle of attack but the coefficient of lift remains flat. After some time you increase and all of a sudden it jumps. So coefficient of lift is for each airfoil could be different than the shape that is shown over here. So uh, CL alpha is nothing but sensitivity of lift to the angle of attack. And that is called as the stability derivative. Now, throughout the discussion further, we are going to talk about a lot of issues like stability derivatives and cross derivatives and uh, stability coefficients and so on. But I want you to understand what do I mean by the stability. If you look at any object or any dynamical system, there are three cases possible. The system could be simply stable, like ball rolling on the surface. System could be asymptotically stable, which means ball rolling inside the cup, or a system could be unstable, ball rolling outside the cup. Now, in the aircraft, same thing happens. Now, imagine, let me, let me get my aircraft. If I have an aircraft, and I want to show this demo to you because this is actually very important. So if I have an aircraft and imagine what happens is because of the airspeed, so the airspeed increases because the wind, wind speed changes, the airspeed increases, all of a sudden lift on the aircraft increase. 
So what happens? The lift on the aircraft increase, which means aircraft is going to pitch up. If without any pilot correction, aircraft goes back to its trim or flying condition, then the aircraft is considered stable. Once again, if you have an aircraft and if aircraft is perturbed or disturbed, for an example, airspeed drops and the aircraft goes down. So, but because of that, again, after some time, the aircraft on its own, without any correction, comes back to the level flight, then the aircraft is considered stable. And what dictates this behavior? The stability derivative. Stability de derivative actually shows whether the aircraft is stable or unstable. Same thing happens in the lateral direction or some same thing happens in the rolling direction. Same thing happens in yawing direction and same thing happens in the pitching direction. So remember, whenever you hear stability derivative, it simply means that that term is going to affect the response of the aircraft to the external disturbance. If the aircraft is able to overcome the external disturbance on its own, then the aircraft is considered to be stable. That external disturbance could be about lateral direction, longitudinal direction, roll, pitch, or yaw. Everyone understood this? As soon as anyone in the aircraft literature, or as a matter of fact, quadcopter literature, you see the word stability derivative, that means that term dictates whether the aircraft can go back to its equilibrium position on its own without pilot correction. Now the next part is drag versus angle of attack. So as you can see, the, as the angle of attack increases, the drag increases. And after some time, the as angle of attack increases, drag shoots up. There are two types of drags. One drag is parasitic drag, and the second drag is induced drag. Now, what are, what are these two drags? The parasitic drag is dependent on the profile, which is the friction, pressure, the drag of the tail surfaces, fuselage, landing gear, so on. So parasitic drag is because of the geometry. And induced drag is the, the outcome. Yeah. So I said the question on the stability derivative. Yeah. So if an aircraft is stable by design, obviously it's easy to design control for it. Is it possible on an aircraft that's not stable by design, you can build a controller that can control Yes, bomber. Uh, if you see Top Gun Maverick, the maneuvers that uh, Maverick is able to perform because that aircraft is designed to be unstable. And the flight control systems are actually actuating it and making it controllable. Because if you have an unstable aircraft, what means it's highly maneuverable. So all the fighter planes or bombers or B2s, they are designed to be unstable. So every yeah. flight that we humankind has created is unstable, right? Which? Every aircraft. No, no, every, so commercial, civilian, uh, uh, Cessna, small aircraft, they are designed to be stable. They have huge margin of stability. I tell you the reason why. Because understand when the aircraft gets loaded, where the CG of the aircraft is dictates how stable the aircraft is. Because what do we want? If the aircraft, if you have a commercial aircraft, if it tips down, we want it to come back to its level flight on its own. That is stability. If the commercial aircraft tips up, then on its own, we want it to come down. We don't want a tipped aircraft going down or going up. So all the commercial aircrafts, jets, or uh, the Cessnas, or small aircraft, they are inherently designed to be stable. As a matter of fact, if you have some experience in flying RC aircraft, there is an important concept which is called the balancing of the aircraft. Wherein what you do is, once you build the aircraft, you hang it by a thread and then adjust the CG so that in the level flight, the aircraft on its own is stable. So there is something 
you do the exact same thing for quadcopter. You have to balance the aircraft. But it is not possible to balance the big 747s or 737s or Max 8s. So that they are designed to be a very huge margin of stability. What is the advantage if you have huge margin of stability? Those aircrafts are difficult to maneuver. They don't turn very quickly. So you make them stable. It makes them sluggish. But for passenger aircrafts, that's okay. But for fighter jets, it's not okay. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, the drones. If you talk about, so drone is a broad term. If it's a, a quadcopter drone, then it is uh, inherently unstable. It's actually under actuated system because remember the quadcopter can go in six directions. Roll pitch, yaw, X, Y, Z, but you only have four actuators. So which means you don't have uh, complete control over the, the drone. But uh, we, we somehow uh, uh, we manage it. We can talk about it when we start quadcopters. Any questions from my online students? Now, one thing I want to tell you, if you have experience in playing golf, golf ball is not smooth. It has dimples. And the reason it has dimples is because it wants to minimize the parasitic drag. So that's why the, the golf ball has dimples. Now, the, the drag and lift models could be linear, could be non-linear. You can become, you can use as complex model as you want, or you can use as simple models as you want. So if we, we will start with a linear model. As you can see, the linear lift and drag model is nothing but a constant uh, CLO, which is the, uh, the CL value when the angle of alpha is equal to zero. And then CL alpha, which is the first derivative of coefficient of lift, with respect to angle of attack multiplied by the angle of attack. So this is a very simple expression that we use. And again, for every airfoil, these values are going to be different. So for aerosonde, you are going to have a file, parameter file. If you use a Zagi plane, there will be a parameter file. If you use a V-tail plane, there will be a parameter fly, uh, file. And actually MATLAB aerospace toolbox, if you specify the name of the, the aircraft, it will go online, fetch that file and populate the, the, the parameter field in your aircraft model. Now, what I want to talk about is, this is something similar that we studied in robotics one. At the end, I want you to understand that there is some F of X, and there is some f of z because we are in the longitudinal plane. We are not looking at f of y. There is a force in the x direction. There is some force in the in the z direction. In the uh, so you have lift force, you have the drag force, and please understand lift and drag force are along uh, the direction that is shown v a and perpendicular to v a. So v a is the air speed and that is given in the stability frame. So drag force and lift force are given in stability frame. So what we do is we use the rotation matrix transformation to convert these lift force and drag force in the body frame. Everyone understood this? So we have the lift force and drag force in the stability frame because they are dependent on the air speed. Air speed is given in the stability frame multiplied by the rotation transformation and you got this very complicated expression. And the reason this expression is complicated because of the rotation transformation. The expression themselves for drag force and lift force, they are not that complicated. But once you perform this uh, uh, matrix multiplication, you get this complicated equation. Then same thing happens with the pitching moment. The only important part is since the pitching moment is about the axis of rotation, you don't have to use rotation transformation because on, on, an, on a bo body, wherever you apply torque, it doesn't matter. So you have this pitching moment 
and for pitching moment no rotation transformations are needed now the next part is lateral dynamics and the idea is the same we looked at the forces in the longitudinal direction now we are going to look at the forces in the lateral direction in lateral direction again it is very important to note few things so let's look at the aircraft let's look at the aircraft and the aircraft coordinate system this is north this is down and this is east so remember you have north you have east and you have down and in the lateral direction what we have is we have the with the, on the longitudinal direction we have the pitching moment in the lateral direction we have the rolling moment and we have the yawing moment so this moment is l north this is moment is m and this moment is n so basically this moment is yawing moment this moment is rolling moment and this is the lateral or force along east everyone understood this now what we are in the last slide last few slides we looked at the dynamics when the aircraft is flying straight here we are looking at the dynamics on the aircraft the side plane so you have the lateral force the rolling moment and yawing moment logic exactly is the same so as you can see you have the dynamic pressure multiplied by the area so this is the dynamic pressure then you have area and then you have this cy this coefficient is dependent on beta which is side slip angle the moment which is p which is the moment about the north so this is x moment r which is the yaw moment delta a which is the aileron deflection ron deflection and r delta r which is the rudder deflection so this is very important i want you to understand i want you to note that dynamic pressure quantity is going to remain the same in the expression for sy expression for l and expression for n only thing is since you have the moment in rolling and in yawing you are multiplying by the lateral length which is b can you see that b appears everywhere so you get moment now cy cl and cn these are the coefficients so cl is the force uh, in the lateral direction cl is the moment rolling moment coefficient and cn is the yawing moment coefficient i want you to understand what are the kinematic variables in the lateral direction kinematic variables in the lateral direction are the moment basically the side slip the side slip means how the aircraft is turning so this is the side slip angle then you have the p which is the rolling moment and then you have r which is yawing moment and then you have the delta aileron which actually gives you the motion uh, aileron is basically roll and then you have the rudder moment which gives you this motion so what you have is those coefficients are the coefficients that are related to kinematic parameters and control surfaces in lateral direction everyone understood this what does lateral mean lateral means like this this is longitudinal this is lateral if you look at the lateral plane uh, why do you still considering uh, the, the this axis north axis this axis is a north axis 
because in the lateral plane, what you are looking at, you are looking at from the top. Can you see in the top? You see movement, this movement. That's why we only thing we don't see this movement. So aircraft can go like this. Aircraft can go like this in the lateral plane. That's why we are looking at this. Is the reason why we are not able to pitching? Pitching moment we considered and when we looked at the linear. So we are saying there is some coupling, but we'll talk about for small values that coupling can be ignored. So now what you can do is you will use exact same logic and expand that expression. And then you will have this expression for CY, which is the coefficient for the lateral force. CL, uh, CL, which is the coefficient for uh, a rolling moment and CN, which is the coefficient for uh, yawning moment. And if you look at what has happened is, please note that the structure of this equation is exactly same. You have a constant, then you have another constant. And then what you have is, you have the derivative with respect to uh, beta multiplied by beta, derivative with respect to P multiplied by P, derivative with respect to R, multiplied by R, derivative with respect to delta A, multiplied by delta A. So what you have here is sort of the Taylor series expansion. Yeah. So what is the V over two V A? V, which one? Uh, with uh, C and P times P. Um, this? Yes. Okay. Now, if you look at this equation, this equation is here, this beta, is dimensionless. It's an angle. If you look at P, P is the moment. So for dimensionally, so this term does not have any dimension. So P has a moment to get rid of the dimension meter. You are dividing it by the airspeed VA. So now this term becomes dimensionless. You cannot add a dimensionless quantity with something with a dimension. So just to make sure that the expression is consistent, it's converted. And again, these coefficients will be given to you. As a matter of fact, uh, if you type in MATLAB and import the aircraft, the MATLAB will import all these coefficients for you. Now, we talked about the aerodynamic coefficients. And again, these are the different types of stability derivatives. And these stability derivatives decide the stability of the aircraft and depending upon whether you are looking at the static stability or dynamic stability what you have is in the case of static stability you have cm alpha which is called as longitudinal stability derivative that must be less than zero cl beta which is the roll static very uh, very uh, derivative and cn uh, beta which is the yaw static stability derivative. Now, I want to explain it to you what this means in simple terms. Cf alpha is less than zero, which means the aircraft would behave something like this. The aircraft goes forward, goes up, on its own comes back, pitches down, on its own comes back. That is the meaning of Cm alpha less than zero. Everyone understood this? So if Cm alpha is less than zero, which means the aircraft is going forward. If it pitches up on its own, it will come back. If it pitches down on its own, it comes back. CL beta, which is the roll static derivative, if it is less than zero, which means for some reason, if aircraft rolls right on its own, it will come back. If it rolls left on its own, it comes back. CN beta, which is the yaw static derivative, which means if aircraft turns left because of the side slip, on its own, it will come back. Turns right, on its own, it will come back. So that is the meaning of the static stability derivatives. Huh? Side slip? Side slip like this. So slide slip angle is big. Hmm? This is like uh, the stability derivatives are uh, the property of aircraft by design. Design, yes. So, so, stability derivatives are the property of aircraft and airfoil by design. And if we were to design, uh, we want static stability derivatives 
less than zero. Which two axes are involved in side slip? Side slip. Side slip. Okay. Let's go back. I'll answer your question in a second. So side slip means aircraft is ideally. So let's look at. Uh, we have inertial frame, vehicle frame, vehicle one frame, then vehicle two frame. No, vehicle two frame, and then body frame. So now vehicle is in the body frame, right? <laughs> then. Since the air is coming at an angle, we go into the stability frame, which means now we are at the VA. But if you have wind, what's going to happen is the wind will turn this aircraft a little bit on this left hand side or right hand side. That angle is beta. So side slip means slipping. How different it is from yaw? So yaw means, okay. Look at the axis of yaw. Yaw is about a vehicle two frame. That will take it. Uh, no, yaw is uh, the first is no. Uh, yaw is first, right? So roll uh, yaw, pitch and roll. Yeah. So first, it's about the the first frame, which is a vehicle frame. Vehicle to vehicle one, vehicle one to vehicle two, vehicle two to body. So that is in that frame. But the side side slip is from the stability frame to wind frame. So the frames are different. And again, effect is the same. So for an example, if you have, you are flying in the level flight, okay? And then if you have a side slip, the effect of slide slip will be in yawing. That is true. But ideally, yaw is different than the side slip because the axis of rotations are different. Yes, your question. I'm not sure. Just one quick question on that uh, in relation. You said wind. You said wind frame, or was that where you were saying body? Frame? Wind frame is the last frame. Last frame. Okay, and then compared to the stability frame, though. It's, See, it's, okay. So let's start. Our first frame is inertial frame. Then move to the CG of the aircraft. That becomes the vehicle frame. Rotate. That becomes vehicle one frame. Right. Then what do we have? We have pitching that becomes vehicle two frame. Then we have rolling. Then we are now in the body frame, right? In body frame, the aircraft is like this, but the wind or the, the uh, air is coming at an angle. If you want aircraft to be aligned with the airframe, I mean the airspeed, then it becomes the, uh, the stability frame. But if you have wind, then what's going to happen is that uh, air direction of the, the airspeed is going to be at an angle. And then if you turn in there, that becomes the, the, uh, the last frame, which is wind frame. Okay, that are quite a few frames. Okay, online students, any question? Now, this is what is the physical interpretation of. Okay, good. Physical interpretation of longitudinal static stability derivative aircraft for some reason. And please understand this happens all the time because of the turbulence, because of the changes in the air field, because of the change in the air density, the dynamic pressure changes. The dynamic pressure changes, the lift and the drag on the aircraft changes. If the lift or drag changes, then aircraft is going to pitch up and down on its own. But as long as the longitudinal static stability is less than zero, the aircraft would come back. Everyone understood this? Imagine like you have a, 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 a sort of a spherical ball uh, in, in, in uh, uh, rolling inside the con convex surface. So basically, it's like in dish. So this is the, the effect of longitudinal static stability derivative. Now, same thing happens with the roll stability derivative. Which means if the aircraft, here is what can happen. There could be some pressure distribution change on the wings of the aircraft. That would cause the aircraft to roll. But as long as the stability derivatives are less than zero, the aircraft would come back to the level flight. Now, there is something else I want to talk about. If you look at an aircraft, the wings are never flat. Usually, the wings are a little bit up. This angle is called as diethral. 
And the reason this dietal angle is called, uh, the angle is important to improve the roll stability. If you look at the aircraft wings, they won't be flat. So large aircraft, they will be like a little bit up. And some of those aircrafts will have winglets that will give a like, little bit better uh, lateral stability. Next part is the yaw stability derivative that depends upon the design of rudder. So basically, rudder means the surface at the, the back. And uh, again, if, if we, it has a positive side slip, it needs to come back. And that is uh, ensured by the rudder stability. Okay. Now, dynamic stability derivative. Now, please understand, uh, you have coefficient of moment, m moment, coefficient of l moment, coefficient of n moment. So basically, those are the derivatives, though they dictate the uh, stability of the aircraft when the aircraft is in motion, which means the aircraft has some non-zero velocity. So that's why those stability derivatives are called as the damping uh, derivatives. Now, here is the difference. So if you have a, think about it like you have spring mass system, these derivatives, they are related to the damping coefficient of the spring mass system. You also have something called as the control derivative. And please understand these control derivatives are dependent on the deflection of control surfaces. We have three control surfaces. We have ailerons, we have elevators, the flat that will actually go, aircraft will go up and down. And we have a rudder, which will actually help turn the aircraft. So we have elevator deflection, aileron deflection, and rudder deflection. So these are called as control derivatives. There are two derivatives. Okay. So can someone tell me L? What is L? Mm -hmm. In aircraft, if I ask you what is L, remember the 12 states that I gave you. L is the moment about x, x direction. Rudder is actually controlling the yaw motion, right? So you have a control surface that is theoretically designed to control yaw, but that is affecting the, the, uh, the moment about x. That's why this is called as the cross control derivative. Everyone understood this? So typically the rudder is uh, in place to control yaw. Elevators are in place to control pitch and aileron are in place to control roll. But now you have, if, if you deflect the rudder, you are going to get some effect on the moment at the axis. This is, this is this moment is not about the rudder axis. That's why this is called as the cross control derivative. Rudder moment, uh, the L is not about the ax rudder axis. Same thing, N is not about the aileron axis. That's why they are called cross control derivatives. Everyone understood this? And you may think that there are a lot, yeah. Is this uh, uh, the coupling effect due to the dialogue? Okay. So basically, yes. So in other words, if you there is yaw to roll coupling, uh, okay. So there is always coupling between yaw and roll. So that's why you have. And there's always coupling between uh, uh, the, the aileron deflection and then yawing. So basically, okay, I'll explain this a little bit. Uh, so what happens is, I want you to think about it. If you have seen uh, a, a rocket take up, so if, if rocket takes off, after some time, what happens is the rocket, if it turns, you will notice it will start spinning. And the reason for that is dynamically, if you look at the equations of motion, as soon as there is a yaw motion, then it gives an inherent role. Uh, the 
The other example uh, which I want to give you is imagine you are driving a car. Okay. Imagine you are driving a car. And if you yaw, you will notice when you yaw, you don't yaw in flat vision. So basically, you yaw, yaw like this. You suddenly turn, you will notice you go like this. And that is the coupling between yaw and roll. So please understand rudder delta R is the yaw control surface that is affecting the rolling movement. Then ailerons are the, the control surfaces controlling the roll that is controlling uh, the, the N derivative, L, M, N, N. So which is, which is nothing but the yawing moment. <coughs> so any other questions before I go further? Okay. So next part is now we come to the prop. So we looked at all the aerodynamic forces. We looked at the all aerodynamic movement. Now, what is causing this aircraft to fly? So basically, we have a prop or a jet that is generating thrust that is pushing the aircraft and or pulling the aircraft. So what you have is, so whenever you have a prop or a jet, think about it like it's a spinning fan. So there is a torque acting on that prop. So there is going to be a counter counter a reaction to that rotation action. So basically what's going to happen is you are going to have a force which is generated by the prop and you are going to have a moment on the aircraft because that prop is rotating. So what it means is you are going to have a component of force TP, which is the thrust generated by propeller and you are going to have a QP which is the moment given by the propeller. Everyone understood this? That's why, please understand, if you have a helicopter, you have that big rotor, and at the end, you have a tail rotor. If, you, if the tail rotor breaks down, then you will notice that the helicopter would start rotating in the counterclockwise direction of the main rotor. So if the main rotor is rotating clockwise, the, air, the, the helicopter body would rotate in the counterclockwise direction. If you do not want a tail rotor, then you have to use a coaxial aircraft, which means there are two basically uh, blades. One blade turns clockwise, the other blade runs counterclockwise, and those two torques, they cancel each other. But on a prop, you are going to have a force, and then you are going to have a torque. Now, how do we? Yeah. If, for example, we have a counter rotating propeller on the aircraft, that torque would the moment then be opposite because it's a different direction of rotation. Is there the same? Okay, that's right. Okay. I understand your question, but um, there are a lot of. So basically, what you're saying is you have two props one prop here, one prop here. And this prop is rotating in one direction. Still, it is going the forward thrust. This prop is rotating in opposite direction. Still, it is giving the forward thrust. But the direction of torques is opposite. It's canceling. Is that right? I was just wondering, if you have one propeller, like on a Cessna. Yeah, one propeller, you can't get rid of torque. You have to, you will, there will be torque. So if you have two, okay, if you have a design, yeah. where it, the the force given by this prop adds with the force given by this prop, but the torque given by this prop cancels the torque given by this prop. Then you minimize the effect of torque. But that requires a different prop design because uh, the thrust generated is uh, the dependent on yeah prop design is a completely. Uh, Different uh, thing. Uh, does designers give more priority to coaxial or uh, propellers because in case one propeller fails, then in order to have maintain the thrust, it's more required. If in coaxial, if one prop fails, that aircraft is going that rotor craft is going to crash. But still, one part of the propeller can be completely turned off, and the piece system can depend on the right side. Okay, so now let me answer this question. So imagine you have you are talking about the plane, or are you talking about the helicopter? Plane. Okay. So what happens is 
the planes are designed in such a way that even if both the props fail, the plane gets, you can fly the plane like a glider and then basically uh, safely touch down. If the plane, uh, one prop stops working, but other prop is working, the pilots are trained to fly the aircraft on one prop. What happens then is you deflect the control surfaces so that the, the reaction forces and reaction torques from this prop, they are controlled, but the aircraft is maintained in the level flight. That's why if you look at, so if you look at Boeing 737, it has three engines. Out of those, even two engines fail, the aircraft can fly. The only thing is you will, the pilots are trained for this type of flying. So there is, there is a lot of engineering that goes so inside it. So actually it is not necessary to set up in the system. So if you have two props, one prop fails, then uh, you can still fly the plane. Or you can watch an Indian Jones movie, right? I don't know if you have seen that movie, that there's a prop plane and then the prop falls down and then the plane starts rotating on its own. Okay, any other question? Okay. So, uh, did I, okay, I just want to explain this real quick. The next expression is going to look very complex, but here is something that you should understand as a roboticist. Torque is proportional, torque is proportional to rho, which is the density. N square, which is the speed, which means you increase the speed, the, the, the basically the thrust will increase. Diameter of the propeller, larger the diameter, larger thrust. And CT, which is called as coefficient of thrust. CT is different for each prop. Similarly, for moment, only difference is, since moment is force multiplied by the radius, can you see that it has become the d to the power phi? So force multiplied by distance becomes moment. That's why the torque equation is rho density n square, square of the velocity, the angular velocity, d to the power phi, and cq, which is the coefficient uh, for moment. And if you look at, if you look at for every prop, you will see a curve like this, experimental curve. That will give you the relationship between the CT, CQ, and there's something called as uh, the advanced ratio J, which is one divided by revolution. So you will have this nice expression uh, for CT and CQ. Once again, we open the design data book, we select the prop, and we actually grab the CT and CQ coefficients. Now, if you are using an electric motor, this equation is valid. So you have different type of power plant. You can have an electric motor. You can have an internal combustion engine. You can have a fuel cell. You can have a solar panel. So depending upon what you use, if you use a DC motor to run that prop, then what you have is you have supplied voltage V in. You have the back EMF for a DC motor, which is KV multiplied by omega and minus the current that is flowing through that multiplied by this K no, K, uh, Q factor, which is the coefficient of motor torque. So if you are using a DC motor, this is the expression that you are going to use. This is the exact same equation for DC motor, whether you are using DC motor for power plant application, you are using DC motor for autonomous vehicle application, DC motor for aircraft application. This expression for Q is going to remain the same. Now, this is where uh, things happen. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, it's coming. This is, okay. You have DC motor. DC motor is an electrical system. Prop, prop, you add that fan. Once you attach that to DC motor, it becomes a turbo machine which means what happens is you are converting electrical energy into a mechanical energy. So the idea is you are going to have an expression for prop. You are going to have an expression for DC motor. 
and what you are going to do is you are going to combine those together and find the equilibrium this is exactly similar logic to you have an engine you have a transmission you put them together and you find the speed at which the system works in equilibrium so you have a prop so prop has certain characteristics dc motor has certain characteristics you combine them together those two characteristic curves they match and that is the operating point and that's what is happening so basically what you have is you have the propeller torque equation you have the dc motor torque equation and for your aircraft to work properly you actually find an equilibrium so torque given by the motor should be equal to the torque absorbed by the propeller and once you equate left hand side and right hand side you get a nice quadratic equation and then what you do is you find roots and then you find the equilibrium solution what does that mean so think about it like this you cannot take a toyota uh, i mean honda civic engine and attach it to a, a hummer transmission so basically similarly you can't just take any random prop and attach to a random motor that prop has to be matched with the motor so if you have some experience in rc planes if you decide to buy a prop it will tell you the motor size that can supply the power and the torque that that propeller design requires so when you consider this equilibrium supply uh, equate the torque of the propeller with the torque of the motor you are going to get this expression and you will get a speed that is the equilibrium speed for that prop motor combination and again this is uh, the expression uh, for determination of prop torque and thrust and again we will talk about this when we actually improve the simulation that we have but uh, this gives you equilibrium speed the last part is the wind model and the most important equation for wind is the ground speed is equal to air speed plus wind speed which means if there is no wind the aircraft air speed is same as ground speed now wind vector wind has two parts wind has a steady state wind and then it has some periodic fluctuation so you have a steady state wind and something called as the gust gust means for small variations in the steady state here is the problem though the steady state component of wind is expressed in the north east down frame so steady state component is expressed in the north east down frame and the gust component is usually expressed in the body frame so wind has two component steady state but that is in different frame and the gust component that is in different frame so what we have to do is we have to use a rotation transformation to combine them together remember all our forces all our moments everything is in what frame body frame so we are going to take that steady state component of the wind frame and convert that into body frame and this is where the transformation takes place and usually what happens is uh, uh we we don't do uh, the actual modeling uh there is always there is a big lookup table and data book that gives you the coefficients of wind and wind models so basically you send white noise to it there is a transfer function that will give you the gust uh, models and then that will get uh, fed up uh, fed to the the wind model so this is called as dryden gust model if you open up matlab aerospace block set there is a block that actually gives you the dryden wind model so what we are going to do is in our aircraft simulation for the wind analysis we are going to grab that block from aerospace block set place in our simulation change the parameters depending upon where we are flying low altitude light turbulence low altitude moderate turbulence etc and matlab will compute all those values for us only thing is we have to feed the roll pitch and yaw information for the appropriate transformation 
and I will show that to you. So all these expressions are needed if you really want to hardcore your values, but we are not going to hardcore the values. All these expressions are programmed inside MATLAB wind model. If you open aerospace block set in Simulink, you will see the wind model. And again, this transfer function implementation is if you want to program it, but MATLAB has done it already. And we just grab it and place it. And then at the end, what you do is you get this big expression, wherein you get the wind velocity, you get uh, the, the relative velocities, you get the airspeed, you get uh, the angle of attack, and you get the side flip angle. And do all those come from the, the states of the aircraft. At the end, what are we doing? At the end, this is what is to be done. Which means once your current project is done, we need to add FX, FY, FZ, and L, M, and N. All these coefficients will come from the Erosonde parameter file. And right now, in your simulation, you are hard coding FX, FY, FZ, L, M, N. What we will do is we'll create a block which is called forces and moments block. That forces and moments block will feed FX, FY, FZ, L, M, and N to our simulation. Everyone understood this? So this is going to be your next project. And I have already uploaded this project. Next project is you have your simulator working. Add the wind model to the MAPSIM simulator. Wind element should produce the wind gust along the body axis and steady state wind along the inertial axis. Extremely simple. Go to Simulink, Aerospace, Lock Set, go to the wind model, drag and drop the block that will give you the wind element. Forces and element, depending upon how uh, ambitious you feel, MATLAB gives you a block, ready made block to find forces and moments. You can grab and place it and modify for your aerosome day simulation or just take these equations and hard code it. And then basically you can verify the simulation. Yeah. That is going to be the next part of the project. Any questions? Yeah. So, so um, yeah i will show you that uh, so and and it's, i don't think it is due anytime soon because next tuesday uh your i think project two or project three two project two is due once you are you have successfully done project two you will move on to project three in project three what you will do is I'll show you. Okay. So go to Simulink. Simulink model. And it's a lot of fun. Once you know, uh, once you go to Simulink, I would recommend that uh, install the aerospace block set. Blank model. It will take some time uh, and then go to uh, aerospace block set. And in the aerospace block set, you have all these functionalities. As a matter of fact, you can actually, uh, there is a flight simulator from aerospace block set that you can uh, add. Okay, I'll show you where that block set is. Okay, library browser. Then go to uh, aerospace block set, aerospace block set. And you can see there are blocks for aerodynamics. There is block for environment. Can you see there is block for wind? 
and these are the different models dryden win model discrete model uh, all these models you can just grab these and then that will uh, find out the appropriate model as a matter of fact what you can do is there is actually you can add uh, equations of motion as well so as a matter of fact you really don't have to create that simulation in Plutonian, you can actually see this is the six degree of Euler simulation, six degree of Plutonian simulation. So you can just grab this. If you want to do it in six degree of ECOF, the only thing what you will have to do is you will have to uh, change uh, the parameters for this aircraft to match with your uh, Aerosonde parameters. That is also super simple. If you go to MATLAB, it will show you import aircraft. Then you go to the Aerosonde parameter file. MATLAB will download the file and populate it over here. Anyway, but I didn't tell you that shortcut earlier. You're welcome to try it. So again, this MATLAB Aerospace Toolbox. Actually, you can do your entire simulation with uh, MATLAB Aerospace Block Set. If you want to add the flight instrumentation, you can actually add all this. And please show you the flight instrumentation. Okay, with that, I'm gonna stop here. <laughs> you can actually do the oh, it is important. Uh, propulsion, you have turbo uh, turbo fan engine system. Let me see. Yeah, spacecraft. Yeah, we don't want spacecraft. There is flight mo actually pilot model as well. If you want to do flight simulator interface, you can add the flight simulator interface. So this is this is very powerful. Okay, uh, I'm gonna stop recording, but I would be happy to answer.